as Episcopalians, we were high, ch getting more and more high church. So even though I wasn't a Catholic, I was praying the rosary. This was something that pulled me. This is why I'm always telling y'all to pray the rosary. Pray the rosary. I was a Protestant praying the rosary. All right. I mean, this is personal for me. And when we were married and all that, we, we were kind of moving along. And I remember preaching against abortion from the pulpit in the Episcopal Church once. I was very involved in pro-life work. And some of the lay people did not appreciate that. I remember meeting with one of the uh, leaders, a man in our congregation, and he said, you know, uh, Father Marshall or Reverend, um, you know, we're all basically pro-life here, but, you know, we shouldn't talk about it. It makes people uncomfortable. It's kind of a political issue. So, you know, just stick to the Bible readings. You know, don't talk about politics. And, and uh, yes, I went to Neshota House, someone asked. That's an Anglican seminary. Uh, stick to the Bible. You know, let's not talk about the abortion stuff. And I said, well, I mean, if, if, if we can't say thou shalt not kill, I mean, why even talk about the Bible? Why even talk about the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed? I mean, this is fundamental. And, and I started to realize, even after I was freshly ordained in the, in the Episcopal church or tradition, I needed something more for that conversation with a layman. I needed an encyclical. I needed a magisterium. I needed a papal document. I mean, I could have philosophically gone through natural law and gone through some Bible verses or whatever, but I realized that really I needed something more. And at, at that moment, I kind of said, you know, I wish I had I wish I were a Catholic priest. I would have more, more tools in my belt. So, and also Joy was watching some EWTN and whatnot. So we decided that in, on our fifth anniversary, 2006, this was 15 years ago, we would take a anniversary trip, our, first anniver our fifth anniversary, but our first major trip to Italy. And we would go to Rome. And we went, and on February 2nd, 2006, that's today, 15 years ago, we, somehow we had, through our hotel or something, we had tickets to go to the Scavi tour. The Scavi tour is the excavation tour under St. Peter's, where you get to go, eventually, as you go through the necropolis, you go to the bones of St. Peter. I actually, later on, wrote a book based on that experience and on Rome and St. Peter and all that. And our tour guide was a, I'd love to meet him if anyone knows him. He was a Dutch priest, a Catholic priest. He was working on a licentiate or a doctorate in Rome, and he was a tour guide in 2006 at the Scavi tour. And I was fascinated when we got to the end and the, all the bones of Peter were there. He led the group out and I waited behind. This is on February 2nd. And I knelt down before the bones. And I was like, Peter, invoking the St. Peter. I was like, Peter, if this is you, this is real. I mean, this is, I was just in awe. Like it was a moment. I don't know if any convictions were made at that moment but I remember like reaching out and asking Peter to pray for me after the tour was over Joe and I were le leaving and the and the Dutch priest said hey you're asking a lot of questions you know what are you what are you here for what are you doing and I said well I'm an Episcopal priest this is my wife Joy she was pregnant um, and uh, we're on kind of a anniversary trip and he goes would you like to go to mass with the Pope and I said, well, yeah, that'd be great. And he goes, come with me. But we went into the church, and it was dark. And I remember, you know, again, I was, st I was standing about where the statue, the bronze statue of St. Peter is. It was dark. And I remember in the back of the church seeing Benedict, Pope Benedict right here, with that candle coming, coming down, everybody else lighting the candles. And he came down in procession, very solemn and went to the altar, and then the Mass began. And like I said in the intro, when it came time for communion, I was around a bunch of nuns. Um, they were kind of moving me to go up to the altar to receive communion, and I knew I could not receive communion. And as I said in the intro, in case you just came in late, I knew in that moment, it was in my guts. It was like 
my guts turned over like a churning. I knew I was a heretic and I knew I was a systematic. I felt in that moment that I was not connected to Pope Benedict. I was not in union. I knew I didn't believe the same faith as the Catholic Church, and I knew I was not in union with it. And I had this terrible, terrible conviction that if I did not enter the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I would be damned in hell, the fires of hell. It was a conviction. I know there's probably some people hearing this and like, oh, that's Jansenist, or oh, I don't know, it sounds kind of scrupulous, Taylor. I mean, I think you were okay. No, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I could feel it. And so I stayed back. Everybody went to communion. Joy and I, of course, did not go to communion. And I knew that when I got home, I was going to go meet with my Episcopal, Episcopalian bishop. I was going to renounce my orders. And I was going to go meet with the Catholic bishop and figure out how to come into the Catholic church. There's no way I would have known that in 15 years I'd be on YouTube talking to you about <laughs> the successor of Pope Benedict. I think I want to tell the story because from a personal point of view, I think it help, It will help you understand why I do the things I do. Why do I always say pray the rosary? Because I was praying the rosary as a Protestant and I know that the graces tug me into the church. Why am I so concerned about heresy, schism, and division in the church because of that moment that I experienced on February 2nd, 2006. I remember when I was an Episcopal priest and all these people were saying, well, let's just not talk about abortion. It's not that big a deal. Let's just kind of talk about sacraments and not talk about the abortion issue. I think to myself, there are Catholics right now. There are bishops who do that to Joe Biden. And what about Joe Biden's soul? And what about the soul of America? So, of course, I got to figure out why is it that I come into the one true church and yet here I am surrounded by what sounds like Episcopalians.